the issues affecting Asia's animals and the stories of the people working on their behalf. We'll be taking you on a tour of what's been happening lately in the animal protection space around Asia and also bringing you updates from our huge network of animal protection organizations and our many working groups. Welcome to the Asia for Animals podcast. Welcome to the latest edition of All About Macaques. Today, we're going to feature Pranitha Moniti, who is a conservationist and a primatologist and an advocate and an activist from India, um, who has founded a grassroots organization and has recently won an award at Oxford Brookes University. Pranitha, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us about the award you were just granted a couple of days ago? <laughs> yes, thank you so much, Brooke. Uh, that was an incredible introduction. So I, like Brooke said, I am from India. I'm a wildlife biologist, conservationist. I have multiple passions and one of them is intersectional welfare. So bringing people, planet, animal welfare together because they have been or thought to be mutually exclusive for a long time and it's time we change that. And that's what I'm trying to do. We'll talk more about that as we go, I think. My award, so yes, so I completed the Primate Conservation Master's course uh, and it's a pathway course, Apes in the Anthropocene. It was from 22 to 23 and I got the award for the overall contribution to the course of primate conservation. Well, from what I understand about you and your work, I think you deserved it. Thank you. It's very prestigious and I'm very, very privileged and very honored to be the recipient. Yeah. And I'm also, I'm a proud Oxford Brooks Primate Conservation MSc graduate myself. So I, we have that in common. <laughs> wow. Okay. I did not know that. Yeah. It was quite a long time ago. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So do you want to tell us about the organization that you founded? The name of the organization, Advaya, correct my pronunciation if you need to, but I'd like to know what that means, first of all, and then just go on from there. So... The entire name of my organization is Advaya Beyond Barriers Foundation. Now, the incorporation, the paperwork, when all that was happening, the name is the most important part because it's stick, right? So I went through a whole horde of names. So I'm somebody who's very linguistically passionate and I know a couple of languages myself. I speak four languages, I understand seven. So <laughs> I was going to Arabic and Latin and Sanskrit and everything, you know, because it really had to, it had to relate to people. It had to make people feel something. And I found some really nice Arabic and Persian names, but unfortunately, given the religious and political climate in India, I could not opt for those. It's a horrible time that we have to think about how a name would religiously bias people, but unfortunately I had to. So I was looking into Sanskrit names and the thing with having a bilingual name is that I didn't want to alienate any particular community or a particular country. Now Advaya in Sanskrit means one or unique and beyond barriers. So it literally translates to we are one beyond barriers. And I needed to have that kind of English uh, section also because my work also has an international basis. I work on international collaborations and with people. I did not want to alienate uh, them. And I did not want to have a completely English name because I work at the grassroots level. I work in bringing communities together. So they also needed to understand that they are going to be an important part of what I'm doing. So that's where the name <laughs> comes from. No, that's really interesting. Thank you for for that explanation. It makes a lot of sense. Um, and it's a beautiful name and it's a really good concept as well. And before we, I think we have a lot of different things to talk about because your work has been very varied over time, as far as I understand. Um, you've got a lot of different experiences, but it seems like with this particular project, you're really drawing those different threads of experience together. So maybe we should start with the different experiences that you have had over time and how they do pull together in this current project. Right. So... 
I've grown up around animals. I've grown up around all sizes, shapes, colors, forms of animals. I have been chased, I've been bitten, I've been pooped on, but I've also been incredibly loved and seen and I could connect. So my first exposure to animals, I think, was dogs and cats. We have a lot of uh, dogs on the streets in India, unfortunately, and I... Well, Maybe fortunately for me, I grew up uh, running on the streets with them, spending days together with them. And I knew everybody. I had named everybody. And there was in, there's always been an inherent sense of connection. And as a child, maybe as a six or seven year old, someone would ask me, what do you want to be when you grow up? I would say dog doctor, because I did not know the word veterinarian. <laughs> And then it changed to veterinarian because I learned the word. And for me, that was the closest I could get to doing work with animals and living my life with them. But then I grew up a little bit more and there was a little lake near my house. And I would go there every day. And I remember there were two species. There was a pair of pied kingfishers and a crab. I don't know what exact species that was, but I would watch them every day. I would get lost watching them for hours. And one day that lake closed because they wanted to construct something next to it. And that was it. I didn't see the pied kingfishers or the crabs again. And there were monkeys also. So in India, we have macaques in most parts of the country. And we had born in macaques who would come foraging near my house and I would have fun. I wanted to like, you know, I wanted to look at them. I wanted to feed them. Unfortunately, I did not know that it was wrong to feed them. I tried to a couple of times and I did do it, but it was more, I was so fascinated with how lit and, you know, just fun they were. But one particular day, one of my neighbors shot at them with a gun. And I got so angry. And I've said this, you know, in a couple of interviews and all. I, I've said this, I've spoken about this story. And I got so angry and I, you know, threw a fit. And I remember I was in the seventh grade, I reckon, around 13, 14 years of age. And I said, I'm going to, you know, complain to the police. And why are you shooting at them? And obviously, needless to say, nobody took me seriously. The wife of the neighbor who shot the monkeys, she came up to me and she said, no, it's, this is not going to hurt the monkeys. It's just, you know, it's going to scare them away a little bit. And maybe it's going to have like leave them a mark on their body. But it wasn't justifiable to me. I didn't really understand why would you do that. And then I got into wildlife rescue and rehabilitation just birds that were uh, that had fallen out of the nest and little worms and horses also not necessarily wildlife but i would treat the ones that came near my house some of them would be limping because all these tonga or the carriage horses they're not really well taken care of and they're just left on the streets to graze and take care of themselves when they're not needed so all of this was happening and then came me entering my very first forest. It was a scrubland. Uh, yeah, I was in primary school and I think there has been no looking back ever since. I kind of I kind of fell in love. And there was this one incident. I was in Nagarhole National Park and a sambar deer was separated from its herd. So the kitchen staff raised him. They tried to reintegrate and it didn't happen. So he would just hang around near the kitchen. And he was okay, they did a good job, but all the tourists that came, it was sort of, they would feed him anything they found from their plate. And, you know, there'd be like multiple people touching him and holding him and, you know, clicking pictures. And I, I trust me, I did not know the ecological consequences of that. I did not know the welfare consequences of that. It just felt wrong. It just felt so wrong because I'm an empath. I tend to feel the emotions and energies of everything and everybody around me. And just imagining being touched by so many people and having fed wrong food, it just, I don't know, maybe it did something inside me because by the end of that stay, we stayed there for a week. And by the end of that week, they asked me, so how was the camp? And, you know, it's just getting feedback. And I remember that's the time I said, I have decided to dedicate my life to protecting the planet, to protecting the environment. And there hasn't been going back ever since. My academics has been life sciences. My undergraduate was, I'm a 
zoology major chemistry botany and zoology major i did my first masters it was a two year masters course in kuwempo university i studied wildlife science and management and then you know, oxford brooks but throughout that i have worked with a grassroots organization in environmental education i worked in acclimatizing children and being uh, talking about conservation education why conservation how conservation why do we need to you know think about welfare what can you do from where you are and then wherever i was i got into a wildlife rescue rehabilitation very seriously so but it's a it's always a huge process like for every rescue call i get i had to call the local rfo and you know get their permission and they keep changing so they either retire or they get transferred elsewhere and we have to start the process from zero forming relationships so, with the right people yes. to be able to carry out this work yeah yeah so i would do that and that also led into confiscating native indian wildlife so a lot of people don't know in india still that having native wildlife as pets is illegal so there was a lot of confiscations that needed to be done and then rehabilitation and then transporting them to the right place that can provide them care so that brought about collaborating with different organizations and people and also learning from them so it went from birds and squirrels to my very first monkey rescue i would have had no idea how to do that if i did not have established collaborations with these rescue centers because in my town we don't have we don't have a rescue center we don't have a rehabilitation center and <laughs> this was my first monkey rescue and it, it was actually a rowdy bunch it was about four or five of them i think none of surprisingly they were all uh, males except one which is very different from what we learn about you know troop formation and behavior and then just looking at them they were the runt of each troop probably got you know kicked out and they couldn't so this fellow that i had to rescue he had a plastic piece lodged in his jaw and the muscle around it had started decaying and obviously he was in pain so i had to catch him now i tried reaching out to local authorities but nobody was really willing so i kind of had to separate him from the troop and they had come near my house which was lucky for me i didn't have to do extra following them around and then i had him for 15 days after that and during his surgery when we removed the thing we realized it was the cap of a toothbrushes you know the plastic caps that people used to protect it was those and he had this very strange habit of whenever so my mom she wears traditional indian attire she wears a kurta so whenever she would come near the cage during his rehabilitation he would perform tricks like he would do somersaults and then put his hand out and then we realized he's probably been with a monkey catcher and you know he's escaped them and now he's just joined this bunch right right so yeah it's probably worth saying that that um, capture of the monkey that you described was done with training that you received from your colleagues at the rescue center wasn't it just i don't I don't want yeah. to uh, give anybody the impression that that's something that they can easily attempt to do on their no no absolutely not so the whole process it actually took me 3 days because the first day i had no idea what to do or how to catch him so i spoke to i remember three different people across three different states who already have rescue and rehab centers and i asked them how do i do this what am i supposed to follow and then they gave me a bunch of options and different people had different approaches and i had to go with what best suited in that time for that monkey and i spoke so the first day i lost him i thought he wouldn't come back because you know, the minute he came in i was not able to close the door and honestly i would not recommend anybody do this because so being with wild animals studying about them and having the experience i know how to read their body language and behavior and i understand that respecting their space is first and foremost so i would not suggest anybody to you know go catch a monkey so yeah this this is how it happened and then 15 days and then we released him he integrated back into the troop they came back just once and you know there was just a from far interaction and that was it that was the last i saw of him yeah can you there's two different things i want to ask you about one is the conservation status of bonnet macaques and also kind of like the maybe not the right words exactly but the social status of them in terms of how how human beings 
tend to relate with them where where you live and work. But I also want to ask you to talk a little bit about the interplay between welfare and conservation, because it, not always, but in some cases, these are seen as very, very separate things. You sort of must choose one or the other. Um, and I think there seems to be an increasing drive uh, to, to think in a slightly more connected way, which I'm really very, very interested in, very, very behind. And it sounds to me like you also see that that's a very important interplay. Yeah. So, so first, I think with all my experience, it hasn't only been wildlife. It has been a lot of dealing with people. It has been a lot of traveling and understanding how communities work and how they think and, you know, what's important for them. Because today, bonnet macaques are listed as vulnerable in the ISCN Red List. But for a common man in the communities that I work with, they laugh at me. <laughs> it's it's funny to them. They're like, we see these monkeys every day, madam. What are you doing? Why are you following the monkeys? You know, they are pests and they come into the house. You can see them. So the thing is, for people, because they can see them everywhere, they don't they don't care about the conservation status they don't for everyday layman not for researchers primatologists yeah we know where they exist we know what kind of issues they are facing the conservation threats all of that but for a person who lives right next to them every day it's not that easy to comprehend that they might be in danger because there are 250 bonnet macaques in the project site that i'm working and if i go tell them that they need to be conserved they look at me like i'm crazy so, <laughs> conservation-wise, initially, bonnet macaques were in Schedule 4 in the Wildlife Protection Act. So, these Schedule 4 were all the vermin species that could be hunted, that had pigs, that had fruit bats, that had bonnet macaques. And then, in April 2023, the Wildlife Protection Act got amended, and now we have only two schedules for wildlife, and bonnet macaques are in Schedule 2. Rhesus macaques have been completely removed. I remember this happening not that long ago, right? Fairly recently? Yeah, it was just last year. And that blew my mind because rhesus macaques, because they are so close to our DNA, they share so much of it in common, and they're used in so much laboratory research. Yeah, I feel as though this potentially opens the door back up for them to start to be exported again for research, which was stopped in like the 1970s from India, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So all of this has been happening and now the bonnet macaques are in schedule two and I'm really thankful that they're still there. We have to work on it for the races macaques still. But talking about conservation and welfare, for one, see when we speak about welfare, we talk about health, we talk about psychological welfare, we talk about emotional welfare. And if any one of these aspects of their welfare is not in the accurate range of health that it should be in how are we going to conserve them <laughs> they're going to die they're going to show abnormal behaviors their population stability will be affected their mating strategies will be affected so there is there has to be no question that welfare is integral for conservation i agree and i'm glad to hear somebody saying that thank you <laughs> <laughs> Even with people, so the thing why I'm so passionate about bringing people, planet, animal welfare together is because in the conservation sector, no matter which country you are from, 90% of the times we are not paid enough. We are not even paid. If enough is very far. We are not even paid. There is no financial security. How can we expect how do we go up to somebody and say, hey, you have to come into the field of wildlife conservation, you have to help us protect our planet, when they are not able to make ends meet, when they are struggling so hard to get two square meals a day. And this may not be true for the richer or more developed countries because the researchers get paid a certain amount. But for the global south or for developing countries, it is still incredibly hard. There is the culture of you have to get married by a certain age. You have so social hierarchical issues. You have family pressure. You, we don't we don't get to just you know <laughs> travel the world and live our lives and passions. That is a privilege for a lot of us. And 
they have children and they have parents that they have to take care of and so many of them have loans and debts which is why a lot of the people want to go into government jobs because it is stable now when all of this is there somebody is trying to they're struggling to keep their children in school somebody needs to take the parent to a hospital and they don't have the money to do that i don't think they would remotely be thinking about oh i have to help save this animal yes because also it's a very disproportionate impact because the impact they have on the environment as communities is much much lower than large corporations or industries or billionaires or research laboratories or deforestation is having we need to find a way to change those ratios and we need to find a way of making our field more financially stable and secure because if people cannot sustain themselves how do we expect them to sustain the world yeah yeah it's a good point can you this this is getting very much towards the sort of like one health aspect of the work that you do um, can you kind of talk about in that in the larger sense kind of describe what that means how it relates to the various things we've been talking about and what the challenges are uh, in in working on that sort of a project Yes. So my Bonnet Macaque One Health project started. The site is called Chamundi Hills in Mysore, Karnataka, and Mysore is one of the most famous tourist regions in the world. We are known as the Palace City. We have royal families, and Dasara is incredibly famous with the elephant procession. I do not endorse it in any way, by the way. <laughs> so Chamundi Hills is an internationally known temple tourist site. and especially during the three months of dasara that we celebrate we have over a million tourists every single day and then we have bonnet macaques in the region yes <laughs> and then we have local communities in the region yeah now the idea the general idea is that so we are very deeply culturally and religiously affiliated to animals in india and while that has also played a positive role in some aspects it also plays a negative role now people devotees and tourists and visitors who come to the temple they think oh the monkeys are there a lot of them the monkeys are there you know they are reincarnations of lord hanuman and that's why they probably here and the monkeys are we get good habitat we're getting food you know <laughs> so we are just and they have evolved to be commensal species right they've lived next to humans for a very long time so now what happens is devotees or tourists who come from the outside they kind of tend to most of them if not all tend to follow what the local communities are doing or they tend to imbibe the behavior of local communities towards monkeys because they live right next to them and it's quite natural right so the local people the local communities the residents everybody they feed the monkeys because a lot of them truly believe that the monkeys do not have enough food which is true to an extent where they they don't have a lot of habitat their roadside habitats which are the trees on either side of the road they get cut down to widen uh, streets etc so they're kind of getting isolated into this one temple site and there are 250 of them who get fed on a daily basis and they get fed oh my god they get fed all kinds of fruits uh, from bananas to watermelons they get cucumbers they they get jamun i'm not sure if you heard of them there so they are a little sour purple colored fruits are they very sweet no they're a little sour oh. they, so they do eat the monkeys do eat jamun from natural sources but bananas not so much so and they now they get fed rotis rotis and chapatis which are types of flat bread and they get biscuits <laughs> proper process <laughs> which i'm sure they enjoy very very much they actually which... have a preference for that and no i'm sure that <laughs> in my experience with captive monkeys i've never quite understood why but they just seem to love bread things and biscuits for sure although they do, they were never fed biscuits but they loved bready things more than anything else yeah <laughs> yeah they have a preference for them and they also get so people feed them water from water bottles because they think the monkeys don't get water now the thing with that is 
there is an open source of water that always has water when the monkeys want. And the monkeys also know how to open a tap and drink water. But just because they get fed by people, and a lot of the... So maybe this is what I have seen. It may not be completely accurate. They love the fruity, carbonated, fruit juicy drinks that people get. And even water bottles... Maybe from afar, they cannot make out whether it's water or fruit juice or they just have a preference to drinking water from a water bottle. We're not really sure what that situation is. But given the choice between an open water source, a very small, you know, little well where it, it'll just probably reach their knees and, you know, they have a platform to sit and drink all of that. But given the choice between that and a water bottle, they will choose a water bottle. Yeah. And I'm not really sure really why. No, I don't know either. It's very yeah. interesting. Huh. <laughs> so <laughs> now what happens? Maybe it might have sweet things in it. Maybe, it, you know, I mean, although I'm sure they can see the color of, the, of what's inside, but they're hoping. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. But they get fed so much that a lot of the times... There's so much food just lying on the street, like lying on the road because they're so full and they don't want to eat anymore. And then some other person shows up and they will feed them a little bit more. Like they, people actually come with huge sacks of food just to feed them. So now we have three different groups of people, types of people trying to feed them. And so one of them is where they're just throwing the food at the monkeys. And there are people who just feed to get a reaction out of the monkeys or to interact with them, take pictures with them. And then there are the other group of people who genuinely ha have a good intention they think the monkeys don't get food they don't get water and they try to feed them and there is also the cultural or religious aspect where people do it because their forefathers have done it before them now our practices need to change with the time applies to the interactions that we have and also the conservation approaches that we need to take now because they get fed so much i was speaking to the local shopkeepers and one of them told me the monkeys already know where to get food if they want biscuit they know which uh, shop to go to if they want ice cream they know which truck they have to go to and if they want just bananas they know where they have to wait they know all of this it's it's their ecosystem and once they go into a shop, all the local shopkeepers have long sticks that they use to scare away the monkeys. They don't really beat them because of the religious aspect. They just try to scare them away because they don't want to incur losses. Now, when nobody is in the shop or when nobody is taking care of them and the monkeys get in by any chance, they tell me that in just 10 to 15 minutes, they can lose 100 to 200 rupees worth of products. Wow. And we know how... Which is serious. It is serious. We can't ignore things like that, can we? No, absolutely not, because their entire livelihood comes from the shop. And we know how monkeys are. They like exploring and throwing things and half-tasting things. And these local people, they also tell me, they say, Madam, at least if they eat it, it's fine. But they open a biscuit packet, eat half, and leave the rest, which is a problem. It's not good for the monkeys, and it's not good for the people. And it's definitely not good for the ecosystem, because monkeys are very important and specialized seed dispersers. We need them. If they're not fed, if they're not provisioned by humans, they travel nearly 20 kilometers a day, foraging and seed dispersing and coming back, which is very important, and also for their own troop dynamics. Yep. Are you finding that that function is being lost in places where there's heavy feeding? Are you finding that the seed dispersal and stuff just isn't happening in the surrounding areas where it would be happening otherwise? Absolutely. So the only time they eat natural food is... So we have a few plants in our project site which have medicinal properties. Our grandparents have told us that and we know that. So we have the uh, people, we, I've seen them eating people leaves and grass, everything that has qualities to improve their digestion and they have antimicrobial properties. In India, we've had this knowledge for many, many generations. And we see them doing that. So all morning, they're eating bad junk food. And then in the evening, they're gorging on grass and people leaves. And a part of me just goes, you know, you have the brains, you, you have the understanding to medicate yourself. But if I could just tell you to please not eat 
all the junk food that you're being fed, life would be so much easier for both of us. But unfortunately, that's not happening. But yes, so now they're not traveling anywhere. This particular troop of monkeys, they're just isolated. No matter what time of the day you go, you're going to find them there. But there is a hill behind my project site. It's much smaller and they have two troops. So I'm not sure if they're sub troops or just different troops altogether. They do interact with each other, but they are not provisioned. And that is a fairly small temple tourist site, but they're not provisioned. And they are so healthy and they travel. If you miss them, you have to go at a particular time in the morning before they go out to footage or you miss them. You can miss them by seconds. And then when you come back, you see them being so agile and active and they don't have any skin issues. They don't have issues of obesity. They're not struggling hard to walk, which is all of the things that are happening in my project side because it's provisioned so much, especially the adults, the ones on the higher positions in the social hierarchy. They are extremely obese. They take a break four times in a span of maybe 100, 150 meters. They're not able to climb up as well. And they're constantly exposed to vehicles. And they've managed to have a good relationship with the dogs. But we are definitely concerned about health and bidirectional disease transfer between them because everybody is just together all the time. And this also leads into the monkeys jumping on people. And unfortunately, in the monkey oh, monkey world, they don't have feminism. So <laughs> when when they want to snatch food or when they the first thing they do is they don't go to adult men. They go to groups of children and they go to groups of girls. They go to groups of women because it's easier and they don't even have to do anything. All they have to go is tug at their clothes a little bit or show them a little bit of an aggressive or defensive expression and that's it. They know that will get the job done. And as much as 21st century women will not like to admit, this is true. <laughs> this is true. It happens. So now that and when it comes to women and children, people can get extra protective. So if there's the slightest scratch or if there is an accidental bite, the it's not just that we'll have to be worried about disease transfer to humans, but it's that the entire population can be wiped out in the blink of an eye if somebody decides to just take one misstep. And that is a massive consequence that we have to live with every single day. And that is what we're trying to change because even though these monkeys there are uh, coming back to, rounding back to the seed dispersal, even if they eat, uh, rarely they do, and even if they eat, natural their natural diet the seed is getting dispersed on concrete not really going into the soil and the place that they are there are already big trees so there's no place for another you know bigger tree to grow they need to be moving they need to be dispersing at wider distances and i've also seen there's so much difference in how the infants behave in provisioned and non-provision sites in my project site the infants, we just finished baby season. They're hardly about two months old now. And I have been in my project site for the last um, nine months. And in that time, I have not seen any of the infants vocalizing. I have not witnessed them being vocal about anything, not even, you know, with each other. Up until very few weeks back, which now they've quite, you know, they've, they've grown a few months into it. But, and they also look very skinny, frail, and dehydrated. You can tell from their skin. And the mothers don't really let them wander off. They constantly have them in their arms. And the other monkeys are, you know, protecting them. Especially when I'm filming. I see this a lot. If I'm trying to film an infant, along with the mother, there's going to be another macaque who will come and close. She's going to show her back and cover the infant if I'm filming, if my lens is pointed at them. And you can, yeah, and I've got that on video. And you can see how sensitive and conscious and protective they are with people. Now, the same thing in the other side where they're not as much provisioned as those on my side are. Around the same, so I used to alternate every day when I saw these differences because I really wanted to catch what's happening. Those infants, the mothers are much more relaxed. They, they're they not constantly 
wanting the infants to come back to them or they're not holding them by their tail. And the infants also look much plumpier, healthier, uh, just as a shine to their fur that the infants in my projects I did not have. And they also vocalize. And I that was the first time I saw a macaque infant vocalizing, which I do not see in my project side at all. You know, they, they try to make themselves bigger and they have little grunts happening when they look at you. Even if I'm filming them, the troop is, they're okay. They're, they're not very worried or very afraid. How do you explain that? How do, what, what's, your, uh, what's your idea about that difference? I think it's more that because the monkeys in my project site, and this is my understanding of it, they get provisioned so much and the adults become so aggressive towards each other. A lot of the young ones in my project site, they don't have tails. They don't have limbs. They don't have legs, arms, cut off, just cut off. And I've seen how much or how serious it can get. The adults really pin them down. And then the young ones are just like screeching and screaming. And all of this happens only when they're getting fed. I think it's because the mothers just want to, you know, protect them. And they're so hyper aware and hyper vigilant of all the people. They, I don't think they ever truly relax until there are no people there. What a shame. Well, I'm glad that you're there working on this and your drive and your passion is really, really clear. They're lucky to have you and people should follow your work for sure. I want to turn the subject a little bit now uh, because you you have worked with grassroots organizations for, for some time and uh, various different organizations, I gather, right? And I know you wanted to talk a little bit about the particular challenges that grassroots organizations face. Let's talk about that. What have the challenges you been that you have seen, uh, like kind of on a on a small scale and on a sort of global scale as well? Right. So I have worked with a couple of grassroots organizations. I worked with a couple of communities. I worked with communities who have been actively taking part in conservation, and I've worked with communities who were abandoned because of conservation initiatives. And so often we say conservation and protecting the planet and all of that. And sometimes it just feels like it's a double-edged sword because yes, there is pure conservation that's happening, but all the people and the communities that get displaced, are there, they don't have homes, they don't have a livelihood. Why would they not turn on you? Why would they go through with it? Why would they join you when you're uprooting them and their entire family and their lifestyles? And I worked with communities in Egypt. I worked with a nonprofit in Madagascar. And I worked with research organizations like NCBS and the Max Planck Institute for Animal Behavior in Germany. They had a research project that was happening in India. So all of this, it really showed me that there is a very huge gap in what we think community conservation to be as to what the policy implementation actually is. There is a very huge gap. And there is a lot of mistrust, rightfully so, because I myself have not had good experiences with government bodies or forest departments or authority figures in any way. And just getting permissions takes the longest of time. Like just for them to give your document a look-see and say, okay, go ahead, because very honestly speaking, these departments are supposed to be at the forefront, leading initiatives like this. But when somebody else from the outside wants to come and do it, they're not within the administration, they're not within the system. There are questions raised as to why is somebody else on the outside doing it? Why aren't you doing it? And now they have to collaborate and they have to oversee things. It's a lot of work that a lot of the times they don't want to do. The second thing is they already have so much work. They have so much paperwork and so much administrative work that they have to look at. This is just extra work. And it's also difficult with bureaucracy and systems corruption. At least in India, it's everywhere. The bureaucratic hurdles, the corruption, everybody wants their hands greased. Or you will only be taken seriously if you're a man or you have money or you have influence. Now, all of my problems can be summed up in one statement. I am 
a 28 year old woman head of a non profit that works for wildlife conservation in india <laughs> all my problems are just there it takes so much effort for us to be taken seriously for the work we are doing to be taken seriously because the first now me personally i'm not very species specific i'm more subject specific now if we're talking about bonnet macaques being provisioned then i'm also doing parallel things branching out to making sure we have enough habitat for fruit bats we have enough habitat for the partridges we have enough habitat for the birds and the snakes and everything so i'm thinking urban conservation and then we branch out to coexistence and all of that the starting point has been the macaque project and when i initially went to the forest department and i spoke to the deputy conservator of forests he's now changed or uh, there's a new person now so when i initially went to speak to him 6 months ago i was laughed out of the room i was told who is going to care about monkeys you should put your research skills to use with leopards and elephants so, so i said i personally did do not still want to open a rehabilitation center because i think rescue and rehabilitation is only a transition from the issue to the solution it's a midpoint it cannot be the end point but if i have a rehabilitation center all my energy and attention is going to go there and i will not be able to address the root causes i will not be able to prevent situations needing rescue and rehabilitation in the first place but we cannot deny the fact that we do need rehabilitation for certain situations and when i was talking to them about this i was told no you just want to you know you know rehabilitation because it looks nice on social media for your generation oh oh that's very insulting isn't it wow i mean yeah that, that is how they speak to us that is how they speak to us and then i said but sir I've hardly posted myself with animals, but my point was, he said there are leopard cubs that uh, leopards like giving birth to cubs in sugarcane fields in India, and the farmers who go see them they get really scared, and in the mornings the leopards go out to hunt, or in the night they go out to hunt, and at some point the cubs are going to be left alone, and they are found by people, and they think they're abandoned. now when somebody gets them or something else happens you need to intervene when somebody else has already intervened instead of leaving them alone and i can't say the fear is wrong because it's a leopard people are going to be scared so in that time duration for when somebody finds the leopard cubs to reuniting them with the mother what are you going to do you need somebody experienced you can't just take the cubs and put them in your office like you've been doing forever which still happens by the way you need to have the right setup you need to understand that they need warmth you need to understand how much human contact they should have if at all and these are, and you can't reunite them within a day or within one night i mean we're very lucky when that happens but when you can't what are you going to do in the meanwhile are you going to let them go hungry or do you know if we're supposed to feed them these these are things that we need to consider and for that a halfway home if i can say is a rehabilitation center and i was told no we are just you know doing it for the social media you need permissions from the pccf the principal chief conservator of forest which i don't think you will get but you can go ahead and ask him <laughs> and, and then i spoke about the monkeys and they said yeah okay we will do it and then i tried to call them again and they ghosted me nobody received my calls they did not give me permission and this is just the basic this is the starting point of all the problems that we yeah, face sure sure this is just to get going isn't it it is that's very very frustrating from your end as sort of the recipient of this but what do you think could happen to start to change that sort of challenge because uh, clearly that's not, it's not going to be just you facing that it'll be anybody trying to to get something going so what has to happen to make that change i think we are all born into a system and we have to make the choice to not follow that same system anymore we need more people coming in and being a part of the system it's difficult i am not saying it's going to be easy we have hurdles every step you take maybe multiple hurdles every step you take but it's time that the work that we're putting in we don't do it just because we have so much love for the planet we need to ask for better we need to ask to be taken seriously we need more young people in politics 
in administration, in offices, and we need more of our previous generations to make that space for us. The way I see it, everybody that has come before us, you have two options. You either join us, help us with your wisdom, guide us, and be a part of what we're trying to do, or please step aside and let the people who have good ideas and who want to put in the work actually be able to do it. Yeah. Do you feel hopeful that this is going to happen at some point in your lifetime? Do you think, do you think there, we're on the way or, or is it just unknown at this point? To be really blunt, our previous generations have to die at some point. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> we're there already. <laughs> well, for some reason, politicians in India survive really long. It's probably all the money and corruption. Yeah. But, <laughs> but no, I do feel hopeful because I know that me personally, I am not backing out. I am not standing down. And it's very difficult. It's not like I wake up every day and think, oh, today I'm going to change the world. No. Some days I just, I just want to crawl back into the blanket and dig a hole for myself and just not face the world because it is so difficult. It is so difficult to be out there. But I am hopeful because I see so many people, I see so many young people, whether it's through fellowships, whether it is through research, they want to make a difference. And they're also asking for better for themselves. And that needs to be acknowledged. There needs to be space that's made for us. But even the young people that are coming into the space, they also need to understand that education is not going to solve anything. You put in the work, you get your hands dirty, you get down on your knees, and education comes as a byproduct of it. Just education and awareness is not going to change anything, right? I see so many content creators. I see so many people uh, talking in UN conferences or COP. And my first question is, what is the work that you're putting in? Great. It's great to talk. It's great to, you know, bridge that gap. But we also need more people doing the actual work. And then the, all the people doing the work form a system because systems are made of us. Very long ago, some people got together and they said, no, for the betterment of the larger group, this is what we're going to do. We're going to bring in some rules and policies, and this is how we're going to regulate it. It's the same thing even now. We just need to change with the times. We're just stuck, especially, I think, in wildlife conservation. We don't have access to the same opportunities or technology or the finances or the economics that maybe the financial sector has, maybe the corporate sector has. Thank you. I think we could probably talk about any one of these things for a very, very long time. But at some point, I realized that you are getting ready to leave, leave the country, in fact. And oh, so we should wrap it up here. It's always great to speak with you. I love hearing about what you're doing. And I encourage everybody to follow Pranitha's work. And we will provide some links for that on our website. So thank you, Pranitha. Yeah, thank you, Brooke. Congratulations for graduating, for your award, and for all of the great work that you're doing. Thanks so much. Uh, just Can I just add two or three things? Of course that? you can. Of course you can. So I think it's very important when we speak about grassroots conservation representation. Representation is very important and reducing those barriers because I have worked in India, I've worked in Madagascar, I've, and I've studied in the UK. And I see that there is such a huge gap. There are so many societies and trusts and committees in places where there's not a lot of biodiversity. So one, please let's focus on building and bringing back the biodiversity in countries that don't have them. And two, when we have researchers coming from these places to range countries or habitat countries, we really need to work on how much representation the grassroots conservationists and researchers get because they don't. The journals are all written in English. All the editorial and board members are all from not range countries, not habitat countries. So where is the representation? How do we expect them to continue doing that work if they're not even recognized? They're not even... That's basic. 
we have to stop being okay with not being recognized. We have to stop with, oh, you know what, I love the planet. And any kind of social work, whether you're working for old people, for children, for animals, this is what happens. We do it because we're so in love with doing the job, but it takes such a huge part of our hearts away. We deserve better than that. And so many people say it's okay to not be okay, but you deserve to be okay. You deserve to be financially sustainable. You deserve to be financially secure. You deserve to be making money out of the good thing that you're doing because so many people are so doing so many bad things and making money out of it. Quite a lot of it, even. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. yes, money is not the ultimate, but we need it to live. Yeah, we do. We do. It we is the goal, that. but you can't do the work if you can't survive, for sure. Exactly, exactly. And anybody who wants to do the work, just have a plan. And there's a lot of gatekeeping. There's a lot of gatekeeping in academia. Just my request would be, please just collaborate. Because we cannot, we cannot keep doing what we've done for so long. We need people to open up the doors and share, this is what we're doing, this is what we learned from it. And of course, we're going to make mistakes. I mean, my I started my master's thesis with a topic and it went in a completely different direction, but it turned out to be an incredible piece of research. Uh, and I put that in my thesis. It was on the first page. I said, this was my original aim, but it turned into this. Because we need to change those narratives. It, it cannot be either this or that. It can be both. And we need that. Fantastic. Thanks, everyone, for listening to today's episode. Uh, we did have some technical problems while recording, so apologies for any glitches that show up. Pranitha has given us a lot of fantastic background for her project and a lot of great things to think about. Thanks, Pranitha. Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening. You can find everything you need to know about our work and connect with us at asiaforanimals.com. Tune in for the next episode. Asia for Animals Coalition, a united voice for Asia's animals.